drowning. So I'm going to talk with book smarts. I think the idea was to talk about um, yeah, book fucker, that book fucker. Um, uh, hey, what's up, book fucker? Wake up, liberal. Damn. I love you. All right. Well, that's a wonderful introduction for me. Why, uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Hey, I'm Aiden. I run a channel called Socials and Done Left. Uh, I think I did a debate with Destiny, and you wanted to talk about that uh, recently. And more generally, I put out some memes that are oh so fire, and uh, I do some debates that are relatively smart. That's about it. What's up with the femboy thing, bro? I mean, what's not up with the femboy thing? Man, the people love it. <laughs> Have like, you considered trying it out? No, bro, I'm not about that stupid shit. Oh, what, you're not about that? <laughs> well, you could just no, shave it off, right? Then you could like put on the dress. You could try it out. What? Oh, did fun thing, fun thing. Um, Cross-dressing as a woman is something that only a man can do. So therefore, it is one of the most masculine things on earth. Well... That's assuming a lot of things about uh, gender and sex. I'm just not comfortable unpacking, bro. Um, it, yeah, I'm not. A, I'm not about that stuff. I think. I think that's a bit much. I think it pushes a, a line. I don't want my audience to start sexualizing me. That's my worry. I'm so sexy already. They're already giving me such mm -hmm. like un, unwanted advances. I feel like I would be like Squad W if I like continued to tempt them by putting on cat ears and stuff bro i think it, that's emotional manipulation that's emotional manipulation <laughs> mm -hmm. wait you don't think that you've educated your audience right to be aware of like the rhetorical tricks that like uh attractive streamers like you could pull to like weasel with their little rectoid brains well the problem is they don't have rectoid brains they got coomer brains oh and fair I, point, I, fair I just point. yeah i just I, I don't see them getting past their nature this has been a uh, truly catastrophic start. Um, what? <laughs> I'm sorry. It's not I... bad. For context, this dude dressed up as a cat boy the other stream, and that's that's what he was up to. What else were you doing on that stream? Oh, I hit 24,000 subscribers on YouTube, so I was doing an AMA. Damn. Or a, what do you call it? Like a viewer calling thing. You're going to have to forgive me because I'm awful and I haven't seen a lot of your content. On YouTube, What what's the typical stuff that you're up to? Uh, sure. I mean, I, I guess I make memes. Uh, people view the memes. That's one thing. Uh, most of the stuff that I do, like most of the content that I do is I have got like a big research document and I use that to engage in like debates and um, uh, debunking of videos. Those are the main things. So like React Andy content and uh, debates with people. Um, so that's kind of it. It's actually pretty hard to find conservatives who are like willing to debate. Um, so, but whatever. I mean, it, do you want to only date conservative people? Do you not want to like debate like other lefty people? I mean, sometimes yes, but like even then, it's like hard to find what you'd call like tankies or like MLs who are willing to debate generally. Um, and mm -hmm. um, it's also hard to find people in like other weird niche ideologies. Um, I don't know, like the, the, the like Twitter, Twitch debater space is almost entirely dominated by like sock dems and socialists, 100%. And like, what do you see as being a way to get more conservatives interested in doing the debate stuff or interested in the platform more broadly? I mean, I don't know how to quite answer that. Like you'd think that with like, the conservatives already have their leading figures. What's it? Um, like the biggest is Tim Pool, who obviously, I guess they do some conversations, but then you've got Ben Shapiro and Crowder are the next biggest ones. And those two are famous for their debates. And yet apparently the conservatives don't enjoy doing debates. So what's going on there? Um, it, it just seems like, honestly, I think the basic answer is that like a lot of them are just afraid. Um, I, like that seems like the simplest answer. A lot of people are, the people that go on Destiny's stream are like abhorrently low quality. People just seem afraid to actually do the debates. Hmm. <laughs> Like, because I think what IRI was saying, um, I, I think that he said in the past that kind of pushing people like Lecture Fan off and treating them poorly when they like start coming up and mm -hmm. constantly like quelling every population of like, uh, you know, conservative audience that comes on is part of the reason why they don't exist on here. And so he tries to like support or at least like explain the importance of conservative voices when they come up on the platform. And I had like never really thought about it like that. Like he's like, you have to realize that people like somebody who is conservative, like somebody like Lecture Fan, there's hundreds or thousands mm -hmm. or whatever of those people out there. So whether or not you agree with the ideology, like it's good to have somebody on the platform to represent that huge group of people. 
I mean, I guess. Like, I don't, I don't necessarily disagree that it's good to have people on. I'm not a big fan of deplatforming or anything like that. Um, the The problem is that like lecture fan is just bad at debating. Like, it, <laughs> I, I, you just need better representation. <laughs> And let's say, like, Ben Shapiro and Crowder are also not good at debating. They just do it. They do, like, a whole kayfabe thing. They prepare for, like, weeks or months beforehand. They go and they debate, like, people who are walking around in college campus with no preparation whatsoever, and they just dunk them. It's all just for show. They are not actually interested in, like, debating these sorts of things. That's why people don't debate Sam Cedar. That's why people don't debate Destiny. Um, I don't know. I don't I think that the, the big wave of them actually doing debates was, like, 2017. They all got crushed, and then now they don't do it. Mm. But I also don't necessarily see people like exploring their ideas in the way that like we have parallel conversations happening to debates on this platform where people are just like free to converse about the ideas they believe in. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I don't feel like we have that for conservative people, really. And every time we do, like they get in trouble. Um, and I got to think that that's also half of the equation that makes it difficult for conservatives on the platform is that they don't have like a conversational space either they'll get in trouble i don't doubt that like i think i'm sure that a lot of lefties are not willing to grant people a lot of i've noticed that a lot of people on the left um in particular are very unwilling to grant any space for like people with very divergent views so i don't doubt that that's true especially if people with like rather more divergent views like those of lecture fan um but hmm. then like of the conservatives you've seen then who do you actually like I mean, that's the thing, though, because, like, when I look at all of the large conservatives, very few of them actually seem to put a lot of the, like, work into researching, preparing for this sort of, like, uh, I don't know, debate-oriented, like, focus for actually defending their ideas in, like, platforms like these. Um, so I'm, I actually am not sure that I could point to any conservative that really orients themselves well, well towards that. Um, hmm. what like, about Tim Pool Destiny? doesn't, Ben Shapiro doesn't. I mean, Destiny is, like, suck them. <laughs> If he's conservative, then I guess we live under, like, socialism or something. Mm, okay. I mean, transitioning off of that, living under socialism, when do you think that's going to happen? Uh, I mean, honestly, like, the long trend of history, I, I point to this chart all the time. I can post it. Um, since 1925, uh, the portion of spending that the state has done on welfare has gone from 1% to about 25%. Um, obviously, socialism isn't when the government does stuff, but like there's this enormous trend um, towards like upwards and upwards spending. There's been a recent decline of like unionization, recent decline of like other leftist things. But in the long trend of history, it's, it certainly seems like we're building increasingly democratic institutions and increasingly like redistributive institutions, increasingly participatory institutions. There's this really great quote from non-socialist, just like center left, maybe sock dem economists. Um, they're, they're in Asimoglu, that free labor, the, the kind of labor that we have nowadays, is actually the historical oddity. Slavery and forced labor were like the long historical norm. We live in like an increasing era of free labor and union organization, um, despite all appearances. So anyway, I, I, would, I don't want to put a number on it, but like it certainly feels like the trends are mostly in the right direction. And here's another thing I don't think people necessarily talk about with, with, with these other things that are getting popular. Have you ever considered that the capitalists may take those things away, that people start to associate unions with like mm -hmm. corporations more than they do unions with like worker movements or anything that like the capitalists through the way that they like allow these institutions to come up through regulations or whatever could make them appear differently to people and could take away like like i, I don't know if i'm explaining this quite well enough um like, like a I, sort I of think cultural could, shift where the young people or something hate unions because they're like ah unions are corporate something along those lines yeah or, or just people stop it like because when you're telling me like oh we've had an increase in unionization we've had an increase in this we've had an increase in this like i don't know if everybody puts together those points and thinks of them as socialism. And I think mm -hmm. even if we give that stuff to people, I think at least in America, enough people have a hate boner against socialism that I think if we get public medicine or something like that, mm -hmm. that the conservative people that dunk on it now will find some way to like uh, get away from that. And they'll still find a way to dislike socialism while supporting like systems that exist right now. Maybe one of the, so like one of the things that I think is very interesting is there's this concept of welfare retrenchment. And a, a lot of studies show once you get welfare in, it's much, much harder to take it away. Like it's sort of a ratchet. It's much easier to put it in place than it is to take it away. And that can be a good or a bad thing. For poorly designed welfare programs, it means it's really hard to undo them. Um, but in general, if we think welfare good, 
uh, it's probably a good thing. Unions might serve a similar purpose, where the stronger unions are, generally also so too are stronger like the political parties that support unions. Um, they have like a symbiotic relationship. American politics is actually like the odd one out on that one. In virtually every other country, social democratic and labor parties were supported by unions and in turn gave a lot of power back to unions. And the big reason that all collapsed is, I, I don't want to pin it on one thing, but if there was one thing to pin it on, it would be the oil crisis of 73. Inflation went through the roof. It destroyed like a huge amount of economies around the world. And in particular, it caused an insane amount of inflation, especially in these like more social democratic countries. And that swept a huge number of governments with more conservative governments who wanted to deregulate the economy as a way of reducing inflation, which is... Uh, the only validity of that is that one predictor of inflation is that strong labor markets are a predictor of inflation, like wages go up, therefore prices go up. But there's no other validity to that argument that you needed like deregulation to get rid of inflation. It's just what actually caused like the, the crash of the social democratic trends since from like 1925, 1970 or so. Um, so I guess the basic answer is I think that what we're seeing right now is we're moving back to what the historical norm was, right? After the economic crisis, uh, the, the IMF, the World Bank, even these big financial institutions, they're all saying, yep, we're increasingly realizing Keynesian stimulus really matters. They're increasingly supporting like unionization. They're increasingly supporting redistribution. They're saying inequality is a big negative effect on development. Um, I guess I basically just say there's this big, there's been this big shift left, even in like the, the quote unquote powerful centers of neoliberalism or whatever. Yeah, and I guess like to be more specific, what I'm talking about is like the socialism brand. Like I think mm -hmm. the brand of sure. socialism, I could see not being rep like not having anything to do with unions anymore or like not getting positive gains even if the unionization or something like that increases. But I, I think what mm -hmm. you're talking about are socialist realities. Like, well, oh, I, I don't care if like what people think about the brand as long as the policies are actually like socialist in nature and they're helping people out. Like, that's kind of where I draw the line. I don't care if it's like contributing to the general idea of socialism being more acceptable mm -hmm. to people. Um, just because a lot of the people that I talk to, both like on here and like offline in emails and stuff that are lefties, they seem to want to push the brand of socialism. They don't want to push like socialist agendas. And I feel like for them, it's very difficult to push the socialist brand. But I feel like if you focus on the realities, on like policies and stuff, that's way easier. Wh which of those do you feel that you land in? Do you feel like you're more so pushing specific policies and stuff? Or do you feel like you're defending the brand a lot of the time? Well, I mean, obviously my channel name is Socialism Done Left. So I do do some yeah. like focus on, I guess, trying to renormalize the brand. But yeah. um, the I would say that my focus is almost always on the policies. Um, partly because of that retrenchment. And there, there's a related bias called, um, I call it policy adoption bias. Once you change what the norms are, people come to believe those are normal. And so like we, we saw that after gay marriage was passed, people were much less likely to move back against gay marriage. And so I think that just by enacting more left-wing policy, you make it so that people think more in more left-wing ways. Um, so like basically I think that it's they're kind of symbiotic, that you do the one, the other will follow. Um, I will say that I, will, I would just note that like Sanders alone has done an enormous amount of work just like normalizing the brand of socialism now. Like the, the youth have like seen significantly increased views towards like whatever socialism means, which for them mostly just means social democracy. But I guess that's a good first step or something. Um, I, I guess I think that maybe in the long run, maybe if it's like 2060, right? Like I, Biden is proposing an enormous expansion of the welfare state, maybe in like 2030 or something when we're trying to run to the left of like Biden. And I know that sounds odd, but like, in historical terms, for the last 40 years, it's an enormous expansion of the welfare state. It's entirely unlike what Obama and Clinton did, um, because they were basically centrist like Democrats um, in, in terms of policymaking. Um, if we're trying to run to the left of that in the future, we might need more clearly to distinguish what is like socialism and what is social democracy, um, because that's where you get into stuff like uh, Elizabeth Warren, I think, wanted co-determination, which I think you could consider a step towards social socialism, whereas others just want to bring back unions, more like Biden, which is just kind of a step in social democracy, I would say. But both do support, I think, the general trend. Wake up, liberal. Yeah. Hello. Uh, like, but, like, do, do you not see that there is a need to, like, have the... Like, I, I know you're saying that Sanders has helped, and mm -hmm. I think he certainly has, and he's done so, like you said, through pushing what is like practical reform things we can vote on, and then like you see that your representatives are getting on board with it, or at least talking about it, then you can mm -hmm. make a decision about it. But I feel like the people that you're attracting through that 
through people like Sanders that are finally considering these at a policy level mm -hmm. are still not on board necessarily at the socialist level. And even if he has that in his name and there are more people that are down with it, mm -hmm. I think if we looked at a proportion of people who are down with like the practical and people who became down with the brand, I think the practical way outweighs the brand. And I just wonder about converting one to the other because if the socialist brand was improved, I could see people being able to accomplish a lot more. And it seems like mm. throughout history, like those that have been able to capitalize on like a socialist brand were able to like really grease the wheels of like getting policies put forward in a timely manner, among other things. Uh, I see. So I think is the argument here that like we could do more substantive stuff were socialism rehabilitated. Um. Yeah, like I see that there's two battles. There's the policy front and then there's the branding front. And mm -hmm. I, I I, don't know if getting more policies necessarily results in like improvements to the brand. As weird as that sounds. Mm -hmm. Because I, I think people quickly disassociate the two, especially if it's something they like. Because if you never address the fact that people just associate socialism with bad, I don't think you ever see like people start to think in those terms or connect the dots between like the way that these uh policies are being designed and like yeah like I, I wish people would realize that like the point is to like inform how you're designing these policies and figuring out who they're helping and i think if more people realize that that was mm -hmm. the aesthetic or that was the thing on the forefront of these people's minds we could get them bought into that brand then we could probably get them okay with more broad like policies Hmm. I mean, so on the first question you posed, just like, how do we link the policy to socialism? I unironically think that the work of both Schenk Uger, um, Cenk Uger and Sanders um, is, is actually relatively similar in this one. It's when the government does a good stuff, you call it socialist. Um, so Schenk has this like infamous speech oh. where he's like, oh, we already live under socialism. Socialism is when the government does stuff, some stuff and, and capital and the, the private sector does some stuff. And Sanders, unironically, offers a similar perspective. He's like, socialism is when the postal office delivers your, your mail on time. Socialism is when you get a social security check. And that's not what socialism is. But I think that tying it to the policies that people like probably does rehabilitate the brand. And I think that um, uh, basically, if you put if you if you take something that people like, you attach the brand name socialism to it, then you might rehabilitate the brand name in, in line with it. You've got to like do that work of it. Um, that'd be a take. Interesting. I don't have data for this, but like, <laughs> I don't know that we could anyway. I mean, like I. When you started saying, I think I think Chank and and Sanders, like when you said Chank, I, I like my, something triggered in my brain. But then you're like, they just like claim that the good stuff is socialism. Like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, yeah, that for sure. Um, I think that is a good way of helping it. Like, oh, but I. Hmm, well, I, I see I, it as like the short term thing. That's like the 2030 goal. Now, now all the people think socialism is just social democracy, and then you can start trying to differentiate it because the, the goal is basically to make it not a dirty word anymore. Like free markets aren't a dirty mm -hmm. word. Libertarianism isn't a dirty word. Conservative, liberal, I mean, maybe they're a little bit dirty words, but like socialism is very much a dirty word. And so I think that the goal needs to be first rehabilitated. And then that like at first you would rehabilitate queer studies or uh, the word queer, and then you could do queer studies is I guess the, the kind of take that I'm giving. Um, hmm. What if there was like an author that came out with a new book that was like, yo, the workers are getting fucked over, but I'm not going to say it's about the workers and whatever. I'm going to talk about like, you know, I don't know, internet Happy workers. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I, do you ever have your ear to the ground for people that are good communicators for these things? And if you do, like, what are some people that you feel like are very good communicators of socialist thought or of like socialist philosophy? There's a small channel. This is the channel that I would say moved me from like a sock dim to like a left winger called Seriously Wrong, S-R-S. -S. I can spell it out in your chat or whatever. Um, yeah. And uh, they're anarchists, so they don't agree with me. I'm like more of a democratic socialist I, or like a market socialist with a big state planning characteristic, something like that. Um, and they're more in like the libertarian socialist corner. But one of the big things that they do is they'll, they'll do like a podcast every week. They'll read a book and they'll try and like take a big idea from it. So one of the favorite ideas that I got from them was this concept of library socialism, um, which is to make a socialist idea, but put it in normalcy terms, term, terms people can understand, like concrete terms. Um, so the idea is that you go to the library, you want a book, you take it, and you take it for two weeks, 
great, You're, you can use the book and then you give it back to the library. You don't need to own that book to make a significant use of it. And they draw an analogy that there's lots of other things that we that this, this sort of concept is useful for. So the simplest one is something like camping equipment. You aren't camping most days in your life. Um, most of the time, like your campaign equipment is going to sit in your basement and be useless. Wouldn't it be so much more efficient where there are like a central repository, maybe by each natural park, where you could just take the camping equipment? Um, this is sort of, I know it's like a very niche example. Um, a related concept is more like, we're even seeing in private circles of like car sharing. Most of the time, you aren't using your car. The idea that you personally need to use your car is just not an efficient outcome, um, either for society or for the individual. Like 95% of the time, it's just sitting there. Um, but were that car to be more widely used by society, either in some, some, something like an Uber sort of situation, which does use the labor of someone, but were they fairly compensated, Uber would be much, much more efficient um, than like private driving. Um, that sounds like an odd thing for socials to say, but like taxiing around is much more efficient than um, private driving around, because at least that car never, ever stops. And the guy driving is like specialized in that work and is actually paid for his labor. Unlike you, you are not paid for your labor of driving to work. Um, hmm. What was it? Famously, Moscow had socialist taxis. So that's just proof of socialism. Okay. Um, I don't yeah, know. The... Moscow is always a good one to go to. Like, I, I think a good like analogy for Moscow would be how like they took all the bread and the grain and they put it in one spot so that they could like <laughs> deliver it evenly to everybody. I think the problem was though when people went to go pull out the grain after working real hard, they didn't have any grain left for them, so they kind of got pissed. The Holodomor was a, a pretty bad example of central planning. I'll agree with that one. Um, I, I, so there I guess are the... people on this website that would disagree with you. Doesn't Dylan Burns argue with people about whether or not it was real or, or it's a genocide or some shit like that? I think, uh, I don't want to get too much into this. My take on it is that um, it's not genocide, but it, it's morally blameworthy. Um, and it was a failure of central planning. Like the, the analogy is... Oh are you no, you're one of the never genociders, bro. Well, no, no, no. I actually think it's a worse indictment of socialism to say it's not a genocide. Because if it's a genocide, then you can just blame it on Stalin. If it's a failure of central planning, you have to like accept that and explain how socialism can do better in the future. Because the basic answer is that um, if you look at the work of what's his name, like Kolchitsky and Wheatcroft, um, who are like normal, respected authors, they aren't like insane tankies or whatever. Um, they show that there wasn't much of an, ethnic, of an ethnic bias. Most of the bias was killing peasants. Um, and so it was, a, it was a central planning fuck over of the peasants and not of like the Ukrainians, as it were. They fucked over other rural ethnicities too. Um, so I actually think this is like a worse indictment of socialism, right? It's you put all of your eggs in the basket and Stalin royally smashed that basket, but he didn't do so because he hated the Ukrainians. He did so because the social system was incompetent at planning. The, or like both. I, I mean, maybe. I just don't think that there's credible evidence for that. Dang. Like one of the, one of the things, again, a, qu a quote from Kolchitsky is like, it's been 90 years. They've been unable to find any quote of like intentional killing, of like trying to like create this sort of like genocidal conditions. I think the, the analogy would be almost to something like, if you want something that's also like morally blameworthy, but I probably wouldn't consider rising level of genocide. It would be something like... Um, oh. The, the, the like Indian, so in, 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 in India, the British, um, they constructed what are called famine railways. Um, and they, used, they wanted those railways to allow people to ship grain around the country. And they were big believers in the free market. And yet what happened during the famines is that in India, food prices were still, uh, food was still worth less than it was in Britain. And so what happened? More grain was actually exported from India and it went over to Britain. And so a lot more people died in India. But to say that the British were like intentionally trying to kill the Indians from that sort of policy, I'm not sure necessarily follows. Because I think that the British truly did believe at the time in their free market ideology, the same way that I would think that like the Stalin and the leaders of the Soviet Union truly did believe in their socialist ideology. They truly thought they were benefiting the people that they ultimately harmed. Okay. Like I know these are like yikes you... takes, but I consider these to be pretty close to the historical consensus. So like for my reading of the literature on both. That's takes, what actually. Mimo's saying. Mimo's like, this is the historical consensus. Okay. H have you seen, um, have you seen any of the arguments on the platform about it at all? Uh, yeah, no, there's some insane people. Like people will cite Grover Fur, who's a fucking English teacher. And they'll be like, ah, oh, yes, a historian. No, he's worthless. Um, and there's other, there's other people who generally just like, cite these narrative accounts of the Holodomor, and those are generally worthless too. I think most of the data-focused authors tend to align in the, like, not genocide, but an enormous fuck-up sort of territory. Okay. Who, who would you say was the most convincing to you Wait, to almost you. get you to think, A, you. maybe it was a genocide? Uh, A, maybe it was anybody? a genocide. Um, like, was oh, there anybody name? where you're like, oh, I could see it. Yeah, that could probably be a genocide, sure. Let me, I'm pulling up 
I, this is like not a good topic for my optics, I suppose. But um, a I'm while trying ago, to save you, dude. <laughs> a, a while ago, I organized the um, the Holodomor genocide question page on Wikipedia, which like highlights a lot of authors who argue this genocide and some who argue that it wasn't, and kind of explains why people. At least when I was done editing it, it explained why people like. Um, um, fucking T Mark Talger, who's another insane person that people cite, and um, Grover Fur are just like utterly absurd and out of line with the historical consensus. And I want to say that what's his face, Timothy Schneider, um, is that his name? It's either Schneider or Snyder. Um, I think no, I'd probably cite Michael Elman. Michael Elman is this professor of economics, and um, I very much liked his book on socialist planning. And he, I think, has one of the of the of the side of things where he argues like he's one of the people who argues it was it was like nationally oriented that it was like quote unquote a genocide. Um, mm -hmm. And I think I, I just respect him a lot more as an author than like some of the other authors who I think are much more narrative focused. That'd be about it. Okay. And and I keep asking this, but you've never seen Dylan Burns talk about this ever. No, I don't regularly follow Dylan Burns, but okay. I, what's I what's think Dylan's would... take on it? <laughs> I he's it's so five head. I couldn't repeat it to you. Like some of the people in the chat are like, I can't believe you're not pushing back on this. I don't know, dude. I'm not a goddamn historian. I, I asked you uh, if there's anybody who's maybe convinced you on it, and you came at me with the I wrote the book. I wrote the whole website talking about this. So, um, okay. No, I, I would I, I name Michael Elman. If you want to read someone, it's Michael Elman. He's like a consistent left liberal um, critic of socialist planning. Um, and he wrote, he literally wrote the book called Socialist Planning, third edition, which is a, a good <laughs> left liberal book on it. So, Okay. Given that you're doing all this reading about these different socialist systems, what's the what what's the ones that you like the most? Like, what are some beautiful solutions that like doesn't matter the scale? It could be like a designing a park even, mm -hmm. but like what what's a place that you think really shows the power of like socialist thought or taking a socialist like uh, approach or perspective to a problem? Um, could you ask this question one more time? I feel like I didn't quite. Like, are, are you just asking, like, models of socialism, models of planning, or? No, so, like, like you were talking before about how some of the policies are where you want to focus and, like, places where we've improved or places mm -hmm. where, like, socialist thought has brought about solutions that are uniquely suited to a problem. And you were talking then about uh, how this person that you listened to called Seriously Wrong mm -hmm. kind of provides some of those analogies in, in a really helpful way. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if taking that a step further if you've seen any like implementations of socialism in the real world where you're like, ah, that, that really gave us a, like a beautiful solution to a problem. And I don't think this would have happened if we would have left it up to like a group that needed to prioritize things in a different way, like maybe for capital purposes or for as much money as we can make or something like that. Sure. So I generally, I don't point to almost any example within the quote, like what tankies will tell you is actually existing socialism, because I think those systems were so utterly flawed and undemocratic that it's really hard to praise any part of their system. Um, I guess the, the best example of like an innovative solution, I think would be um, probably Swedish collective bargaining, which is obviously in the context of social democracy, not socialism, but it was part of um, the broader push of the Swedish social democrats from the, the 50s to the 70s to try and start organizing to actually start doing socialism. And then, of course, the 73 oil crash came, inflation killed the project, and the conservatives got voted in. Um, what a surprise. But um, uh, the, the, the basic idea of like the, the problems that it was solved were um, there, there are huge wage differentials, and this has problems in terms of causing inequality, um, and it also has problems in terms of what they call solidarity. It's that you are paid differently than your coworker, and so you kind of envy them a little bit. If you know that you're all being paid the same thing, what's called in, in, the, in the bargaining program a solidarity wage, it's much easier to like, work with your coworker because there's a sense of like solidarity is the argument. I don't know quite how true that is. That's the political argument, and I don't have data on that. Um, but I think it's an interesting argument because it does align with all, a lot of the arguments about universalism and like how UBI has less stigma and so on. So onto like the problem that it actually solved. Uh, one is the solidarity thing. And the second problem is it seems to increase efficiency um, due to like an odd quirk of the system. Basically how uh, Swedish collective bargaining would work is um, all the unions, the government and the business would sit down at a table, set, that's why it's central uh, bargaining, and they would set a wage for every worker in a given field. So let's say it's welding or something. Everyone welding is gonna get paid 
I don't actually know what the wages in kroner are, but let's say it's 400 kroner. And um, how this works is that the unproductive firms generally can't pay those wages, which is the same sort of problem that you have under minimum wages, but the high productivity firms can pay well more than those wages. And so ironically, what happens is that the high productivity firms get extra profits, and so they are highly incentivized to become even more productive. And so there's this actually like distribution of workers from less productive to more productive firms. You also see it under the minimum wage, but it's even more extreme under uh, the collective bargaining example. So it's, it's like a social solution that also has efficiency gains, which is a really good solution. Yeah. Well, huh. That's interesting to think about. So if we could, hmm, wait, wait, why don't we take this approach more then? Like how, what, why don't we like, like we were talking before about how you can associate the good things with socialism. I wonder if you started to draw a picture between like socialism and profitable ventures, if that would really start to like hamper the, uh, the beliefs that people have about it. Like if you started to show socialist programs that could turn a profit atop like helping as many people as they possibly can or uh, upholding values that are less yikers, I wonder if that would be convincing to people. I think that it already is to some degree. That's why people, hmm. that, that, that's why the rhetorical strategy of pointing to like the Nords is so popular. That's why Bernie Sanders does it all the time. And even conservatives have to do it now. You, you know the Economic Freedom Index that the Heritage Publ Inst uh, Foundation publishes? Mm-mm. Um, it's whenever you, if you ever talk to a libertarian and they say economic freedom actually correlates with success, um, if you ask for their source nine, maybe, I don't know, probably like 95 times out of a hundred or so, it's going to be the economic freedom index from the heritage foundation. And so the index is like incredibly stupid, which I can explain at length if you want. But, um, the long and short of it is that it is, it has provided them this rhetorical in where they can claim that the EFI proves that economic freedom is actually really high in Sweden and Norway and Denmark and Finland. And therefore the reason these countries all have low poverty, high education, high innovation, low corruption, good democracy, high press freedom, it's actually because they're economically free. And so even the conservatives have to do the rhetoric to get in on like, hey, these models look really appealing right now. Hmm. Who do you feel like has the best criticisms of socialism? It's clearly not the libertarians because they're a bunch of dumb fucks. But mm -hmm. like, who do you find like has the most convincing like things that kind of persuade you over to different solutions to problems? Or does that not happen? Um, I would say, I mean, generally it's the left liberals and the sock Dems because they usually mm. acknowledge a lot of the same problems that I acknowledge. Um, and so they'll acknowledge like, hey, inequality is bad, but I have another solution for it. Hey, I agree that like high wage dispersion is, is a problem, but I have another solution for it. And they'll say that actually your socialist solution, which goes further and wants to give the workers like, I don't know, it wants to put all the workers in charge of all the firms. I say, you know, we don't actually need to do that. We'll just keep the unions. We'll keep the co-determination and it'll all work out good enough. Um, I think that one of the blogs, that there's this blog that I really like um, because it's, again, very data heavy called um, Social Democracy for the 21st Century, which is explicitly a, a, a play on words to, um, what's his face? Chavez's, Chavez called his ideology Socialism of the 21st Century. Um, and they do, they have like a whole bunch of pages discussing like labor theory value. They have a whole bunch of pages discussing like socialist economics. They have, and then they have like reams of pages debunking Austrians and like libertarians and gold, gold buggers. Um, um, like people want to go back to the gold standard, stuff like that. Um. Okay. <laughs> Sorry if my transition between uh, my transitions between questions are no good. That's what I struggle with. I'm trying to get better with these interview things. Um, like you don't need. You don't need. Apologize. I don't need You're to, fine. Oh, okay. Um, so. Like, be, because what I'm trying to get out of you is I'm interested in the way that you talk about these problems. Mm -hmm. uh, and though, though the one conversation I saw you in with Destiny didn't, he didn't really give you the patience that I think you deserve. I thought that like the, the thought process was good. And then everything else that I've checked on from your YouTube channel also looks similar. Like you seem to focus on things that I can agree are important. And that's why I'm interested to like Wait, see different up, creators and people that Hello? you like. And you seem well read. It seems like you read this stuff. Who are some like lefterly creators that you like? Um, um, whether it's libs or sock dems or anarchists or whatever, beyond just the seriously wrong dude. I feel like most of the more left content that I really like has come in books. Um, I'm trying to think. One person that I could like provisionally recommend. Um, yeah, okay, book smarts. Do your little dance, okay? Um, <laughs> 
uh, I could provisionally recommend parts of a guy named Paul Cockshot, and yes, the name is funny, um, who uh, his faults are basically that he's like extremely in favor of economic planning. I don't think that's defensible. He has some really bad ideas about economic planning. Like he basically wants de facto equal wages, which I think is untenable. Um, and he's also like basically de facto transphobic and gayphobic or whatever. So like putting that baggage aside, I thought that he had some really um, insightful responses to um, the economic calculation problem, which is like a common libertarian critique. Um, and his, he had some interesting arguments about democracy under socialism. Um, so one of his main arguments for democracy under socialism is this idea of sortition and direct election. So um, do you know what the word sortition means? And if not, it's totally fine. No idea. Okay, no idea. so um, you know how juries work, right? It's like ra- supposed to be randomly selected people, and then we pick a subset of them, and they're on the court, uh, mm-hmm. ignoring like exclusion and all that. That is like the process of sortition. Um, in ancient Greece, that is literally actually how they picked the court. They had this big machine in the center of Athens. Not ancient Greece, just Athens. Um, and they, they rolled this ball in like down, uh, what is it called, like a plinky machine or whatever. And they like rolled the ball down and which column it landed in, that column of the 10 columns was the people who would be the jury for the day. They would pick out 100 random people by a giant like kachinko machine or something. And those people would be the ones who would be the jury for the day. And their theory was you can't bribe a randomly selected juror. Um, those randomly selected jurors can't be like the aristocrats. They can't be from one tribe because there were a whole bunch of warring ethnicities in Athens. And so this idea of random sortition got a truly representative popu- uh, uh, section of the populace. Um, and I, I don't know that it's like a, it's not a perfect system, but there's this general principle that in direct democratic elections, we see much more representative turnout than we do in non-direct democratic elections. Um, here, here's an odd example that I hadn't thought about almost ever in terms of like representation of minorities. Um, uh, very few people in Congress are seriously, have serious health issues. Um, I mean, I guess, possibly leaving like accusations of mental health decline aside, virtually no one in Congress has serious health issues. Um, and in contrast, the general populace does have a pretty high rate. Like one in 10 people in America have a disability of some kind. Um, and there, there was this study in Finland that when you do direct democratic elections, um, the portion of people who with serious health illnesses was exactly the same as it was in the general populace. But the portion of the parliament is like, I don't know, it's like one fifth or one tenth as large as it is in the general populace. And so there's all of these sorts of like representational issues that argue for direct democracy. So in short, um, the basic takeaway that I got from Paul Cockshot is sortition, it's a neat democratic mechanism to ensure representative populations. And two, direct democracy, it can also ensure more generally representative mechanisms. The one thing that I didn't catch in that was, sure. okay, it, it, and it may just be because this idea didn't click for me. Sure. Um, when you're talking about sort, sortition, mm-hmm. you're talking like, we would have candidate names at the bottom and we would we would drop or are we dropping for groups of voters that would then be able to vote Mm, so maybe that wasn't clear so like let's say you want to have a how do i put this so like there there are certain positions that you might not want elected officials to be in charge of but you would still like to be democratic so there's this concern that like you don't necessarily want representative officials to be in charge of running the elections because there's this fear that they could like a- abuse that power to run their own elections in their own favor. Now, I'm not sure I'm totally sold on that fear, right? I'm not sure it's totally realistic, but it's like a common enough complaint in virtually every democracy on earth that I can understand why people raise it. Um, and so one of the ideas is, hey, you simply select a citizen board. You like randomly draw or supposedly randomly, this is where the concern would come in, but let's say you could truly randomly draw a thousand citizens and they just are your citizen board and they have the ability to like exercise some level of oversight to this board. Then I think you can argue that there's like a higher degree of citizen um, involvement in the government that doesn't necessarily have to go through like the, um, the, the sort of voting representational process um, because of the okay. kind of biases we laid out before. So the sortition is to decide on an oversight oh committee and who's on the oversight committee then. Well, it's I, I guess I, sortition is just a method. Where you apply it is kind of up to you. Juries are almost sortition, right? We do it in the justice system, but we very rarely do it in the elected system. But well, the, in the past, the where is what I was interested in. <laughs> like, are, are are we using it for for the members of this committee, or are we using it for like uh, like electoral voters, or like how are how is that working? That's sure. that's what I was asking. I, so my argument is generally, um, the, the way I think about these things is there are certain institutions that I think are so crucial to the running of democracy that I would like to ensure that the people have the most direct control over them. And so that's stuff like running elections, probably like oversight of the media, um, 
may, and maybe oversight of like cultural productions or something along those lines. Um, because I think that all of those give like representatives kind of the ability to put their, their thumb on the, on the, 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 what do you call it? The balance scales or whatever. And like push things towards their side. Mm -hmm. But I like what, what I'm asking is like for the sortition, you're only mm -hmm. using that to determine like the members of a citizen oversight community for the people running the elections. Uh, and that's what I was trying to clarify, because if you if you use this on other things, I think that would be much more interesting. Like it would be funny if you signed up to vote, but whether or not you actually got to <laughs> vote was determined by this lottery. And everybody's just like, I signed up this year. Fuck yeah, I'm going to I'm going to get picked this time. I'm going to decide our president. Fuck you guys. And like like I, I thought that's what you meant. And I'm like, no, oh, no, no, no. It's, that's it, quite it, it, the... So the oh, what is it? There are there are. There are basically like three methods of of democracy. Is the way to think about it. There's like represent. There's um, elections. There's sortition, and then there's appointment. Um, and so appointment only works if you think the the institution appointing it is democratic. The other two are like ways of directly getting citizens involved in the process. Um, that's a, like these are these are like methods of selection. But I do I do understand why it would be odd if like only one in a thousand people could actually vote. <laughs> No, I like it. I mean, you've said it, and it sounds anti-democratic, oh but I actually, I really like that idea. We were talking earlier about that that Cat do, Island, bro. I think I would put that on the Cat Island. So, do you know? Actually, we do sortition in another part of the judicial judicial system. It's um, which judges get appointed to the appeals court. Um, for every uh, appeals court case, there are three judges that are randomly selected from all the judges in that court, in that in like district. And um, this is actually used by a whole bunch of researchers because whenever researchers hear the word random, they salivate because then they can prove that there's a causal effect. It's not just some like random correlation or something. Uh, we use this to prove lots of evidence about like judicial bias. Uh, and so like there was this really neat study which demonstrated that um, I think it's Republicans give black people like a six month longer sentence and they give women like a one month shorter, shorter sentence for comparable crimes because they have this random data set. Um, and so this is the kind of stuff where you can actually prove outcomes because of random assignment. So anyway, it's interesting i like this idea i think this idea would be quite the meme in a few different places like I, like hold on Let, let's be real for a second is it anti-democratic to like have people sign up and then there's like a, a one in five chance or something that they actually get a vote is that really anti-democratic well it depends on your definition of democracy and so to me, the definition of democracy is just representative um, power, right? It's that like the power, uh, the holders of power are roughly equivalent to the, the portion of people in the general populace. Uh, and so I assume if your one in five is genuinely random uh, by, by what's called the law of large numbers, it technically would be representative. So I, I guess I can't oppose it, but I really hate the idea. You're also probably not an authority on democracy because you are a like, socialist, you know. Oh my God! The one one of the big things I think that Cockshot got me um, to agree on is that, like, uh, to some extent, what's it? Um, the the I think it's the the Norwegian Social Democrats said that their their program was um, uh, it was like cultural democracy, economic democracy, and social democracy, something along those lines. It's this idea of putting democracy in the workplace, putting democracy in society at large, putting democracy over like the institutions of power in their country, um, and so I. I to me, the goal of socialism, I know that other people have different ideas of what socialism means to them, right? You, you put like, you put seven socialists in a room, you're going to get 11 definitions coming out. Um, the, my idea of socialism, to me, is fundamentally about trying to extend the principle of democracy in, in as many areas as possible. Um, it's about like a, a truly participatory society. Mm. And who gets to participate will be decided by sortition. By, by like a huge marble, you know, like the, the New York ball drop or whatever, right? Like every New Year's, they'll like drop this enormous ball, that, but like a giant pachinko machine. And at the bottom, it decides which demographic groups get to vote this year. <laughs> oh, imagine if we put all the counties of a state at the bottom and we open the ballot box and count only the <laughs> one that ball falls in. That that would really equalize things for the rural communities. We should bundle them all up and they should have to sortition which ones we listen to. Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> that would be hell. <laughs> that would be awesome. Fucking potato farmers are winning out this year. Fuck you, sugar cane. <laughs> That'd be lovely. I'd like that. I like this idea. Any other crazy fucking socialist ideas I can take like this, bro? Um, what was the other main one? 
you're fueling the fo- the the fodder that I'm gonna have when I grift to be a socialist and I pretend I'm gonna bring up all this all this crazy shit. Grift to be a socialist, you gotta th- you the real grift, you, right? We were just talking about it. Become conservative. Oh, I left the left, right? The left. They kept telling me to be a femboy. They kept trying to sexualize me. I just couldn't handle it. I'm a right. I'm morally upstanding man, preserving my virginity until marriage. And so I left the left, and now I'm on the right. Okay. And David Cock has given me big dollars, and that's totally unrelated to my ideological shift. Well, good thing for me, I'm going to do a bunch of characters, so that's definitely going to be the other one. These, <laughs> these leftist sexualizing men. Interesting. I like that. Um, okay. I mean, the other the other big one that people point to for, like, market socialism stuff would probably be, like, this is the most boring one, but it's, like, the social wealth fund. Um, uh, like, Alaska has this permanent fund. Norway has, like, the Norwegian social wealth fund. Basically, it's just invest some portion of the money that the government gets each year into a big wealth fund, have a money manager in charge of it, it's invest in the, in the market, and it grows and grows and grows and grows. Um, and so over time, there is this, like, natural, like, pseudo-nationalization of the economy as, like, the state just owns more and more of, of wealth. And de facto, that gives, like, um, if you assume the state is truly democratic and if you assume that, like, the, the workers or whatever are, the tr- are like, vo- the majority of voters, then to some degree, this does mean, like, a shift towards increasing amounts of, like, worker control of the economy. Indirectly, anyway. Yeah. And, and it worked because the socialist people in charge decided to put all that money in a market because that's how you grow money right <laughs> this the socialist just... people in charge had the opportunity and they said nah fuck this socialism shit if we really care about the people we cannot subject them to socialist rule gotta put their money in a market yep true true okay yeah bit by bit right you're bit you're helping me build my case you're helping me build my case Okay. What do you feel like are some killer arguments that you hear socialists use? Like you talked about this a bit before Mm -hmm. with the guy whose book mostly tackled like libertarian ideas, but has there been anybody that you've seen combating like socialist ideas who's doing like a good job of that or a socialist person who's trumping other people that's doing a good job of it with like a particular argument? Um. I mean, a book that's in very much the same vein. So Cockshot's arguments are all about what's called the economic calculation problem. Uh, a, a more modern and a, a book that's from two union organizers who, as far as I'm aware, don't have like all the baggage that's associated with the, the very Scottish name of Cockshot um, uh, is called The People's Republic of Walmart, which is essentially a, a light, like pseudo-economic response to the economic calculation problem. It says, hey, look inside of Walmart, look inside of Amazon. They're basically essentially planned. Amazon doesn't have a big market inside of it for you know 99.99% of its operations. It doesn't have some market deciding how to assign its funds. It's all centrally planned. Uh, so the argument then is, hey, if Amazon can do it, why can't like the state? What is different about Amazon? And you know there, there's responses to that, right? Libertarians aren't just like, oh, oh my God, uh, I've never heard of this before. They'll say like, oh, it's the it's the market around Amazon that forces it to be competitive. Um, but then you get into whole arguments that like, hey, maybe the socialists can ensure that there's there's like competition for government services and things like that. But I just think that the book is like a nice, nice light. That's the key introduction to the economic calculation problem. Cockshot has like linear algebra in his in his like books, so much less light. That's interesting. Okay, and like, like I. Hmm. Yeah, in a socialist state could live in a capitalist world and just on the inside it centrally plans its shit like anybody else. Like I, I almost feel like uh, aren't our normal governments just like a light version of a socialist government? Like they they just like seize like power over certain functions of the market and like take it back when they feel like they absolutely need to or the people will freak the fuck out. Like are, aren't they just giving like an uber long leash to business that they pull on from time to time and we're just like asking them to kind of rein that in a little bit like i i never understood why it's so difficult to get people to realize that government is like the only tool we have over cor- uh, over like corporations um h- how is this idea like communicated in your own discussions with people on the topic like how do you get them to like realize the role that government plays in regulating business and like lean into that more um i mean i don't usually talk about I, I do talk about it. I don't have like very well formed ideas on this. The, the 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 term I think that there's power in a word. The term that I've sometimes liked to say about these things is horizontalization or distribution of power. Um, and so there's this idea that like um, if I have, if I want to plug another book, if you want to read one, 
is um, it's called the Narrow Corridor by I, I want to say he's a Sokdem, um, Darren Asamoglu and I think Robinson. Um, and their argument, in short, is that successful, that high growth democratic societies have generally had a combination of like increasing growth of the government and increasing growth of like civil service and civil society. Um, so like you'll see growth of unions and unions can check the government both for and against. You'll see the growth of like the ACLU and other like pluralistic institutions that can check the government. Um, and basically his, their argument is that you need a growth of like simultaneously the government and things that keep it in check. Um, and so one of the other parts of that book was proving to my mind the, the utter failures of like highly centralized um, power. Um, so basically, when a corporation has a whole bunch of power, it can decide to do things that are at odds with the market or at odds with the people. And so um, they basically show like a lot of evidence that um, why is it that some societies like are, are, just don't transition to democracy, like Saudi Arabia, for example? Their answer is basically that because a few elites have accumulated so much wealth, they have so much control over the national rents um, that they don't need the workers to like do an industrial society. They can basically just rely on extracting natural resources. Um, in contrast, most industrialized societies got this huge base of workers who were politically engaged and educated and able to like fight for democracy. And so that's why some societies moved to democracy faster and earlier, and some didn't. Um, and in short, the argument there to me, like the natural conclusion of that to me seems to be, hey, if highly concentrated power is bad, then probably highly unconcentrated power is better. It's like more stable for democracy. The more people who control our media, the more people who control economic power, um, the probably the more stable that democracy is, the harder it is for it to like resist, um, I don't know, the, the easier it is for it to resist fascism and the easier it is to, for it to resist like, like coups and so on. Um, so the argument there is that like, that the movement towards more unions, more like uh, more localized political power, more decentralized uh, media ownership, all these things provides kind of like checks to ensure that democracy is maintained. Mm. I, li I like that idea, like uh, separating the state from these other institutions that almost like serve to both have checks on like industry and the market, but also like the state itself. Um, and and I, I think that there is there is some truth to like starting out with giving power to those smaller institutions and that's going to help like the state have more power and in, in a more responsible way. Um, like, uh, I, I really hate to go back to any socialist country cause they've all just not worked out so well, but isn't this what happened with like Russia? Didn't they have a bunch of like tiny communes or tiny, uh, worker coalitions or whatever and that's what ended up forming their government that turned into what it turned into not Isn't really they... like the oh okay one of the big reasons so i'm a reformist market socialist um i think they got to maintain some markets markets also can provide a check on the government because they aren't directly under the sway of the government business owners especially if they're worker cooperatives and they're highly like politically active in unions and so on um they can provide a check on the government the, the other element here is reformism and so i think that what we've seen is that there's Get another book recommendation. China with Stefan, 2011, The Strategic Logic of Nonviolent Resistance. Um, and they show that statistically, um, violent revolutions are much more likely to either lead to democratic backsliding or no democratic gain, whereas um, what they call like nonviolent mass movements are significantly likely to lead to increases of democracy. And so the Bolshevik Revolution was not a nonviolent mass movement. A tenth of the country died in the Civil War between 1918 and 1922. Um, like it's a lot of people. <laughs> and, um, my argument is that, uh, the reason that you see high centralization in China, high centralization in Korea, high centralization in the USSR is because these countries had to fight for their lives in a civil war that was all or nothing, a total war. And so as a result, there were all, all the little worker, local worker co-ops were crushed because the state needed those rifles and they don't care if you want to go on a strike, they're just going to kill you. Um, <laughs> and I, basically, yeah. And so like war destroys like those local democracies, um, a, 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 a incrementalist path can maintain those democracies. Um, someone who briefly mentioned this uh, is Edward Bernstein. If you want to read someone who wrote in 1899, <laughs> if you want to oh, get the, no. the theory pass, you can read Edward Bernstein, whose argument is to build socialism, we need to like slowly expand the power of the state to run more and more things. We can't just do it all at once. And if we do it in a revolution, we won't just be able to seize things tomorrow because we won't have the experience. That's his argument. Interesting. And like, hmm. That would be interesting to explore. I, I might be interested in reading about it. People are memeing about a socialist theme book club. Maybe. 
I keep getting recommendations, maybe. I, to be clear, none of these books are explicitly, I guess, except The People's Republic of Walmart um, is explicitly socialist. They're just like, I would say they're somewhere between left liberal and sock them. But I think that the core of them, to me, is that they're all really big fans of democracy. And my argument is that ultimately, if you keep expanding democracy and expanding democracy, you know, workplaces right now, they're de facto dictatorships. The guy at the top runs it. Your only option is to leave or to like abide by those rules. Expanding democracy in the workplace, expanding democracy in like the government, um, expanding democracy in like a whole bunch of cultural institutions. Um, these are like all to me the, the goals of socialism. And so that's why I think that I, I very much like these books. But at the same time, I would say that like, like, it increasing like the power that all these individual people have is only as good as all the individual people. I, I like mm -hmm. ever since seeing how these elections have been turning out in America, I really do worry that like, like you were saying, these smaller institutions need to come up at the same time as like state power, mm -hmm. it, even if that's democratically owned state power. Um, like if if you have a bunch of dumb fucks, like your education is no good. It's unfortunate and people can be, especially now with the internet and stuff, another country can just put millions of dollars into like influencing your little socialist country and ruin it. Or uh, somebody like the US can like try to fuck up and coup up your country. Um, so I, I wonder like, Sorry. Like, like, like how, how lucky certain countries have been in this regard. Like if we talk about the one before that you had mentioned, put all of the money into a trust fund that went into the markets and then benefited all the people and they managed the money well, like they were mm -hmm. lucky to have had strong institutions and strong government before they discovered that they were like resource rich. Yeah. Because Norway. had that happened in a different order, they would be screwed. Yeah. Like Saudi Arabia. Um, one yeah. of the, one of the, What's interesting, near the very end of the book, in the narrow corridor, Asa Moglu points to what he thinks is the best example of simultaneously building state power and building civil power, um, what he calls society power. And it's Sweden is, is an example he names, because simultaneously they built unions, they have more or less moved unions into virtually every like organize, every like firm in the country. Um, they built out a huge like coalition of political opposition, they built out these new political parties, um, and they expanded state power at the same time. And so... If you want one more book recommendation, it would probably be Politics is for Power, Hirsch, um, which I think Destiny read, and you might. Yeah. Um, one of the, the arguments that it raises is um, basically that part of the reason we've seen declining participation and so on about politics is that we've just seen the decline of these like local organizations, because re most organization is local. It, most people don't feel a real bind to, I shouldn't say it like that. Most people can't be made to get out and canvas by national organizations. They need local organizations to do so. And so um, he points to the collapse of religion, the collapse of unions, and the collapse of local political machines um, as like part of the reason for why we've seen the collapse of like local political organizing. Um, and so he's not defending any of these. He points out that most of the political machines were racist. I would point out that religion is like a highly reactionary institution, I think. Um, and yeah. the, 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 um, and unions often too were like extremely racist. So like these things, like doing things, just go back to the 1950s. No questions asked is not like the correct option. <laughs> um, the, the solution I think is to attempt to do, um, to return to the good parts of the past there. It would be attempt to encourage local political participation. So to me, this means publicly funded elections and probably publicly funded permanent staffs, permanent local staffs for political parties. Uh, because one of the things that he points out is that effective local organization often involves one or two people who are just like permanently paid to sit there and organize their communities, uh, akin to a pastor, if we want to draw, draw an analogy. Um, and uh, a huge expansion of unions, because unions, too, are a way for workers to get to know each other. And I think that this has benefits beyond politics. Um, something that I've often mentioned is we are literally the loneliest we've ever been. Um, every person in this country, regardless of their de demographics, regardless of their age, is the loneliest you've ever been. We are at the highest risk of suicide that we've ever been, and it's because of that loneliness. And part of the reason that we're seeing rising terrorism um, is because loneliness is one of the key drivers of believing conspiracy theories and getting involved in terrorist groups, uh, which sounds like it sounds crazy. But the main reason people join terrorist groups is to get a social bond, which I, I, the more you read about it, I know, I know it sounds crazy, but the more you read about it, it is literally true. Um, and so people are joining these alt-right groups because they're lonely. <laughs> And so you give them unions, you give them local political organizations, you provide them another path. They don't do that stuff. Um, yeah. That makes sense to me. 
like I, I I've always had the sneaking suspicion that a lot of the people that are gathering together in these groups are probably doing so because they're lonely. Like when I see a bunch of socialists getting together talking about revolution, I can't help but think those are some lonely people <laughs> doing this out of some like lack of social interaction. Um, I'm just moving, but no, I mean, I get it. Uh, okay. Like. <sighs> kind of building on that do you see any realistic solution beyond like finding a group and going for it like are you subscribed to anybody like uh dr k who's trying to help people at an individual level work through that or jordan peterson or anybody else about loneliness you mean yeah loneliness or just like anxiety or or any of the other things that seem to plague modern society right now well, i'm subscribed to a my psychiatrist and they give me a sister eyes and i quite like those um <laughs> I guess I don't focus too much on the SSRIs. I'm like the political person. Um, mm. I, I guess um, to you me, the solution lot. is not individual. It, it's it's systemic. Like the reason people are lonely is not because they all we all collectively chose to individually be lonely. Um, it's because the institutions around us have kind of fallen apart. Um, local media has fallen apart. Local unions have fallen apart. Local religions have fallen apart. I, this is a conservative talking point, but also like families to some degree have become separated. They become smaller in each family unit. Um, like the, the average household now has fewer people. So you're you just lonelier in the average household. Um, the move to suburbia, it pushed people physically further apart. There was this, oh my God, there was this incredible statistic in a Brookings Institution publication um, that the average American drives 10 minutes for their average like daily activity. Um, which doesn't sound too crazy if you're in a car, um, but it's 10 minutes to go to the grocery store. It's 10 minutes to go to friends. It's 10 minutes to go to like wherever. And it all just adds up. That's 10 minutes both ways. Um, and I guess the, the point is that like, there seems to be a lot of utility of like moving people into like more dense environments, moving people to like have these like community organizations. Um, and I think that you basically need to change the system uh, to get people to back to where they were. And what leads you to believe that? Because I think you could just as easily say that, like, well, I, I, I don't know. I don't want to put an idea in your head, but like, um, what, what have you seen that makes here. you think? <laughs> like, what, what have you seen that leads you to believe that this is an institution problem, not an individual problem? Sure. Um, or at I... least that the solution necessarily needs to be like institutional and that there's no way to like encourage individuals to, to do it. I guess I don't know that any, I'm trying to think of evidence that would specifically point to one and not to the other. Most of the evidence that I'm pointing to, like the stuff that Hirsch cites is just strong correlations. Like you see declining religiosity, people get more lonely. You see declining um, community organizations, people get more lonely. Um, it can't necessarily prove that people aren't like choosing to do these things. Um, I know that there's this anecdote, and it's not, I, I understand anecdotes, low quality, but it's a funny one, um, or a little funny anyway, is that increasingly people who call them, people increasingly call themselves spiritual but not religious, and what that mostly means is they don't attend religious service, but they still want to be involved in religion, um, like they, they, they still want to be involved in their spirituality, and so there's an example he cites of like, there's a bunch of these apps popping up, and it'll be like, I don't know, the, the Jewish Friday prayer app or whatever. And it will give you like an inspirational quote and like a tiny little quote from, I don't actually know what the holy text of modern Judaism is, but it will give you like a little quote from that. And you'll, you'll like look at it and you'll be like, ah, yes, I've been involved in my spirituality. And you won't do anything. You won't give to local community organizations. You won't go to like the local um, Sabbath or anything. It's this totally individualistic sense of religion. Um, and so it's this idea that in the past, you'd go to your church and you'd talk to people, you'd get to know them, you'd get involved in these like sort of, um, often ethnicity and like ethnic ethno religious groups that would organize your community that's gone um, that would be the anecdote I'd point to I don't have very strong evidence to prove that it's not just individuals all choosing to make this this choice but yeah because like at least from my perspective I see it being easier to put out content at least for us as content creators to put out content that will spur in people or or inspire them like the will to go out and do stuff and I feel like uh, like it, it's almost impossible for me as an individual to try and bolster these groups and have it have the effect that I that I am expecting it to. But it's it's very reasonable to think that I could put out streams focused on telling people how to do stuff or encouraging people to go out and do stuff or mm -hmm. walking them through that. And that's much more likely to have like a, a, a measurable impact, like um, for as much uh like garbage is thrown her way. Aiden Wood 
I, I really mm -hmm. like how much like on the ground activism. Wait, people hate Aiden Wood? I yeah, a lot of the debate people really don't like Aiden. Um Aww. It, but that's because she doesn't like playing their game and she's not good at playing their game. But she's very good at playing her game. She's very good at like doing boots on the ground activism and like going out into her community. And I think it's important to have people that make that a normal part of their life and they broadcast that on stream because then it makes other people feel like that ought to be a normal part of their life. Like if you never grew up with a parent that took you to political stuff or you didn't grow up actually like engaging in any of these processes, you don't even have a frame of reference for like, mm -hmm. what is, what does that involve? What do I go out and do? Like how, like what is the, how, how much of my time is that going to take? Can I show up once? Like there's a lot of like hitting questions they haven't even thought about that are keeping them from doing it. But if they can see you do it and you're a role model for it, I feel like that could have a much bigger impact than trying to bolster the institutions themselves. So I totally get, it seems like the, the gist of your argument is telling people, hey, it's just institutions that doesn't really help them go out and actually solve it, right? You need something that individuals can do. Yeah. So I totally get that. Um, and that's one of the big reasons I did like um, Hirsch's Politics is for Power, because at, at its heart, it's all, our, it's all fundamentally an argument that um, individuals should go out and do that local organization. Um, I think actually one of the big failings of the book is it doesn't provide at the end like a little manual like he here are the most effective steps to like I don't know sign up a little precinct lo lo your local democratic precinct um, here's the paperwork you're gonna want to ask for here's like the how to get the voter the the voter access like database thing um, I, so I, I was actually a little sad about that at the end but like no it's it's totally all about that um, and I do like that Aiden Wood normalizes um, uh, like community activism I totally agree with that. I know that this is like a this is an individual, not a community thing. I was going to plan to um, probably do like phone banking or text banking um, near the the January fifth uh, Georgia elections, um, so try nice. and normalize that as well. Um, but I think that like Aiden Wood doing it is also a great example of that. Um, I was just going to mention what you what you said reminded me of this quote from Hersher's book again. Um, there was this dude who was a college, I want to say sophomore, and they formed their local democratic precinct and they organized people. And it actually became a social group because a lot of elderly people in that community didn't have much of a social group. And so the quote goes, this group serves a really important social role in the lives of our members. People send Drew, the organizer, notes saying they've met more friends in this town in the last year than the previous 20. For some retirees, Precinct 206 had become their primary social network. Now, again, anecdotes, but I think it's important to note that like the social benefit of this is extremely important. Um, I, I totally, I'd like, I don't really know what to say. Like Aiden Wood, good. She's a good model. I should do more stuff like that. My goal is I, I want to do the local organization stuff. I don't know that I'm actually going to be living where I currently am. So I'm trying to wait until I know that I have like a more stable footing. Well, to build on what you're saying, if the community is like a huge, like, I know you're talking about it as a benefit, but it seems that even on its face, it's actually good at selling like the thing itself. Maybe like, yeah. um, like the, the reason why I'm trying to explore this as well is I want to help people that are doing that stuff and help them do it better and encourage people better because there are some people that go out and do this stuff and I, I want to help them convert as many people as possible. Maybe one thing to focus on is the sense of community that you're mm -hmm. guaranteed by engaging in these things. Maybe like during a stream where you're, where you're going out and you're doing that stuff, maybe focusing on like, oh, I, I made so-and-so friend through this and I met this person. Look at this guy. He fucking comes here. Like, like mm -hmm, when mm -hmm. IRI talks about um, like seeing the same people at multiple rallies and getting to know people just by participating in them, I find that that's like an interesting sell to people who, who are lonely. Mm -hmm. Maybe that, that would be more persuasive to them than just being out and doing something good. Maybe like actually selling them on the, on the friends you can make and that kind of stuff is more persuasive to them. I think it's almost certainly true that it, it, if it's not more persuasive, it's certainly like an additional persuasion. Um, like totally. Yeah. Thumbs up. Hmm. Okay. Okay. And if you were to focus on that, like beyond the community thing, what are some other like big benefits of doing things in person that, that you've like found or that you think might be persuasive to people? Um, I mean, most of my in-person experience has just been like, um, it's mostly been like student groups, which hasn't hasn't been very effective. Um, I would say like it, those were generally conversational sort of things. But I would say like ha you you form like a 
a student group is is another social group. So I, I, I think I was um, president of my like local secular student alliance. Um, so a lot of secular kids, very, like much more lonely than religious kids. Um, and so like it provides like a fringe network that religious people sometimes just kind of inbuilt get because they go to they go to like a regular um, how do I put this? There's a reason you form friends with people that you go to work with because you see them over and over and over again. It's the same reason you form parasocial relationships. All the people looking at both of our faces think that we're their friends, even though we virtually never talk to them or haven't meaningfully interacted with them in any way. It's just because they see us over and over and over again. And so our stupid reptoid brains are like, ah, yes, this face I've seen many times is our friend. So same thing happens in community work. For better and for worse, you will think of the people there as your friends because you've seen them over and over and over again. Um, and so... Uh, like it I, I would just say like that has is like a genuine thing that i've observed it genuinely does reduce loneliness and doesn't create a sense of friendship though that all has been destroyed in the last year or so because of covid but whatever well taking your approach where you want to like bolster the institutions or you want to make them more attractive i mean like like how can institutions do that like what are the, what are the groups that you currently help out or, or volunteer at what can they do what would your advice be if you were in charge of them to make them more appealing to these people who aren't going out and like aren't doing this stuff um i know that this isn't advice this is like a joke one of the one of the groups i went to was called the international socialist organization and they dissolved because their head was in, was uh, accused of sexual assault um so don't do that Advice number one, don't have leadership who is involved in, like, crimes. Um, but... Um, insert Vosh joke here. <laughs> insert Vosh joke. Um, Sorry, I mean Irish laddie. Um, he's a changed man, right? Um, the, reformed. The, yeah, no, no, right? He's, he's reformed. He's not, he's, he hasn't revolted. He's reformed. Um, I, I guess the... I think really selling the friend group part of it could be one thing. And I think, too, the other thing that a lot of the student groups didn't do is any serious political activism. So one of the things that I noticed, I, I was also in, like, college Dems. Um, and when I read Hirsch's description of, like, most college groups, I was immediately struck with how apt it was for mine. It's you'd go there, a local politician who's running for office would give you a speech. You'd be like, ah, yes, this is a really rousing speech. And after an hour, you'd go home. Uh, maybe you have pizza afterwards and like that can be a nice way to get a social group which again has the benefits the other groups have but you don't actually do anything um, <laughs> and uh, he cites these anecdotes again where they could get a hundred people on buses to go listen to Pete Buttigieg and Bernie Sanders do rallies but they could only get two people to go and canvas in New Hampshire for like a, this um, I think they were in like a Yale area school um, and so a lot of people, they'll happily go for the kind of the social events, for the fun events, to like go listen to the guy that inspires them, but they will not do the like dirty work of actually going around and talking to people. Um, and so I think normalizing that um, might be a step towards that. One of the examples that he points to of a successful group is that it's the, the one I just mentioned to you, the guy with Drew. It's, um, I want to say they're in North Carolina, but I might be totally wrong about that. So some college in North Carolina, they integrated the college Democrat group with the local precinct group. So now permanently precinct 206 has one board member who's a part of the college Democrats. And as a tradition, not as like a rule or anything, but as a tradition, the college Democrats will go and meet with precinct 206 at their local meetings. Um, at least that's how I understand it. And so to me, these all seem like things that are going to normalize this as an activity. And they're also going to normalize you forming community relationships with local people. Okay. And do you think there's anything to having like uh, like a appealing people in role model positions for these groups as well? Like making it appealing to be the hardworking person? Because you made a connection to work. And I think that like, like uh, one really important thing to like keep people at a job, like um, it, it is to try and make sure that the leaders are people that they can connect to, that the people mm -hmm. in charge of them are, are beyond just being like agreeable are actually like role models like there's somebody that the person aspires to be or they demonstrate like characteristics that that person finds value in and like a lot of leadership styles nowadays are trying to like sell their workers on why the person above them or in charge of them is like better than them in some way or has qualities that they would like to emulate yeah. and i wonder if like having really charismatic and like uh like involved in hardworking people doing the phone banks and stuff and going around and then talking to the people that are new and like connecting with them on the difficulty of the work 
could encourage those people to keep doing the hard work. So people will show up for pizza, like you're saying, and they don't care, mm -hmm. uh, but it's difficult to get them to do the hard work. I wonder if part of encouraging them to do the hard work is to show people they admire engaging in that. And then it makes them feel like, you know, to I emulate that person. One of the things, uh, were you, did, did you follow any of like the hubbub with the, the, I think it was the Democratic caucus calls right after the election, like it was like November 6th or something. And there was like a leaked call from a centrist dem. Mm -mm, what happened? Um, I, it, leaked is like a, a light term. It was going to become public anyway. Um, a cent, this, it was the whole thing where the centrist dems were like, hey, we lost this election because of defund the police. And AOC was arguing, hey, we lost this election because we didn't have enough local organization. And so something I thought was interesting is I hope AOC, who is this widely respected leader on the left, becomes this sort of local organizer. She put out this whole... Um, it, I don't, an image on Twitter, like PR release. I don't know what you fucking call it. And one of its big things that it argued for is we need local, long-term, like grassroots ground organization, um, as opposed to uh, what's called like last-minute canvassing. Right? You 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 get you you got like a week before the election. Everyone is going to go knock doors, and those people have like a two percent increased chance of voting. Um, these sort of long-term grassroots organizations are the kind that Hirsch is talking about, where you've got a permanent member who is just there to organize, and that's their one thing they do. They try and convince people, they get people involved locally, and then those people disproportionately do a go and actually end up voting for that party um and so basically i i my dream is like yes exactly what you said and aoc should do that and fucking um, what's his name beto o'rourke published something saying something very similar too so beto and uh, aoc they got the they got the star power on the both genders right or all genders or whatever and um they're gonna rock it okay they're gonna they're gonna prove that local canvassing is the ideal yeah, you almost fucked that up. Good all genders, bro. You really, you really saved that one. Look, I'm agender, so I get to say whatever I want. Okay, I have the. Oh, I have are the, you? I have every possible what? pass. Dang. Okay. Are Are you uncomfortable with he? Should I say they? I really couldn't care less. But that's not that's not meant to be like a mean thing. I'm just saying like I don't care, so say whatever you want. <laughs> well, how How privileged you are to not have to oh, worry my about your pronouns. God. <laughs> awesome. Was there anything in specific with me you wanted to talk about at all? I, so I thought this was a very productive conversation, I felt. But I feel like originally when we were you were mentioning this to me, you'd wanted to talk about Destiny, um, like my debate with Destiny, and like rhetoric or messaging or something along those lines. And I feel like we never quite got around to those. So if you want to get to those, we could talk about those. But I don't have a very strong affinity to those. Yeah, I just wanted to get like... Like, on its face, I think that's a good way to trick you into this conversation. But, Loki, what I'm trying to get out of it is I'm trying to pick your brain. I'm trying to get good books. I'm trying to, like, uh, see how you're into Like, because now that I, I've been streaming for, like, a year or something, I think, um, I, I, I'm really starting to value new people that are coming on or people that, like, recently got like a lot of popularity around something and seeing how they're like how they're interpreting things or like how they think about stuff before twitch destroys their brain um because i really think that twitch destroys your brain and it's been unfortunate to see a bunch of people have their brain turned to cottage cheese but like i know that yeah i don't so there's this term that hirsch uses called like political hobbyism and i also like the a related idea of like political cheerleading or whatever it's just this idea that you do something for personal fun or you do it on the sidelines but you don't actually like play with skin in the game um and one of the things that frustrated me it's like a very niche thing is that there's so many political streamers on youtube and twitch who have these enormous platforms who don't spend their time doing political advocacy um like it, it's to me, because it's just like, the, it's the epitome of the parasocial relationship. It's like, you like this person because they say things you like. Um, you like this person enough that you're willing to watch them for things that are even totally unrelated to your political stuff. And on the one hand, that's good for building a community. Like, that's the whole benefit we're talking about of, like, decreased loneliness. On the other hand, though, they aren't they aren't providing you this example of, like, the hardworking political organizer or even, like, political speaker. Because I do think that there is value in people who can, like, convince people of, like, our ideas. It's no use organizing people if, like, everyone hates socialism or whatever. Um, So I, my, my gripe is that people play video games, okay? Hassan, I'm looking at you. Cyberpunk 2077, more like organizing 2077. You better get on it.
Well, like, I, I mean, you said it yourself. I mean, people are picking people that are saying the things that they like and they like listening. I, I, and this gets back to like why I think encouraging individual change might be the best thing we can do as influencers. Because I think that the problem is that people are picking people that say the things that they like. Mm -hmm. And they're not picking the people who are the people they want to be. And I think that, that that's be. a, that's, that's like a big problem. Like, I, I think people like what certain people on the platform say, but if you were to like zoom out and live their life from like third person, like mm -hmm. for the whole day, I don't think you would like that person. <laughs> and so I think for, for, for like a lot of these people, they just like what the person says. They like the show they put on, but they dupe themselves into thinking that that means that they like the person for who they are mm -hmm. and they don't, they just like what they say. Um, how yeah, do you I like, okay. It, like Sorry, is this something that you're that you're seeing as well or like no i mean that's that's basically it that it's people it, it's the the big thing that hirsch does is show that a lot of politics is like sports you don't like your team because you've got a very strong wealth out of reason for liking your team you just like it because that's your team and he he literally demonstrates that they're very equivalent stats but for like various questions like would you have your child marry like a patriots fan versus would you have your child marry a republican um sort of things and so a lot of this is just tribalism you like your guy because he's your guy um and it's not necessarily because you've got again this like really principled argument for why you really like this guy totally agree yeah 100 percent. okay and like then from your perspective do, do you ever think as a streamer that you dip into like saying the things that are liked and not doing the things that are liked or not being the person that uh other people should aspire to be and instead saying the things you expect that they want to hear i mean ultimately right if if my big advocacy my like my trump card for what, how we're going to fix the whole system is local grassroots organization and i'm not like actively showing it then i suppose anything i do falls into that but like short of that i think that um i i would say that like the the other really important thing is trying to um the other two big really important things i should say is like one trying to convince people that these things are true and two trying to explain how best to explain that they're true um, I do think there's utility in both of those. And so I do try to spend most of my time doing those things, uh, like either engaging in conversations like the one that we're currently having and trying to like find ways to effectively explain them to you, uh, who I presume does not hold all of my views. Um, and, um, and then the other time is like, usually it's like the usual debunk stuff or whatever, right? It's like trying to confirm people's ideological prior. So they stay leftists. What's up, liberal? Okay. I love you. And, and like, I, I hate to say this, but like, do do you ever feel like you could use this to like paint the right people the wrong way? Like, may, oh, maybe absolutely. You could point There's out... so much room for abuse. Are you kidding? <laughs> okay, interesting. I'm just I'm just checking. I'm there just there are no checks on this platform. Who's going to fact check you? If if Hassan lies, if Destiny lies, if I lie, who's going to like cut my pay or something? Holy shit! Okay, then are you going to blow up and you're just going to grift, bro? Is that where you're at with it too? I, I personally would like to believe that I'm like a sincere believer, right? I'm, 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 I'm cut of the true cloth or whatever. Uh, I suppose I can't really know, but I'd like to believe that I have, that I am. Um, so, so you're like a true lefty then? You're just a I, grifter, right? <laughs> yes, the true lefty is grifting. Um, you're the lefty destiny in, warned me about, bro. In, in, the, in, the famous, uh, in the famous quote from Vladimir Lenin, right? True socialism is when you get paid a whole bunch of money to say things online. Um, I mean, this is actually like a big concern of mine. Is this big? One of the one of the upsides of really centralized media is you can much more easily fact check it, right? Like it's it's so much easier to fact check Fox News or big like centralized institutions than it is to fact check a thousand tiny little institutions. Um, and so one of the things that I wanted those like sortition people's council sort of things um, to be in charge of was ultimately. I would like a shift to pull fully publicly funded media, something akin to like Patreon, or if you've heard of it, democracy vouchers, um, where every person gets like a $5 monthly stipend or something that they can spend on, let's say political news. They can send $5 to their favorite political news creator. Um, it's it's basically the way that ads work, but it's here it's a little bit more intentional. So you aren't just sending it to something because you like that content, you're sending it because you're like directly choosing it. Uh, again, the analogy is like uh, democracy vouchers, which I think are a thing in Oregon, but I could be wrong. I, I, know, no, I know they're a thing in Seattle. Um, and my argument is I, once we've got this like publicly funded system, I would literally like 
for these citizens commissions to be in charge of in some way limiting people's funding for violating like um violating basically being fake news for like publishing things that aren't based in fact publishing things that are based in opinion and the reason i want to leave it to like citizens is um say like ask citizens ask a thousand citizens make sure that 80 percent of them agree like hey is this channel publishing fake news yes okay well we're going to cut their funding by 50 percent for like three months or something along those lines um, so you can directly force media to be more truthful because right now alt media has virtually no like safeguards for truth the only things you can't do is lie so bad like alex jones that you get deplatformed and people won't advertise on you anymore and then youtube will kick you off like the guardrails are so far wide that literally anything goes it's extremely frightening actually I mean, you keep going back like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to say something I've been avoiding saying, okay? <laughs> you keep going back to all these democratic solutions. I think I'm a bit, I'm a bit, you know, I, I, I don't think very well of democracy. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I Like, we give all this power to the people, but you're, you're ultimately relying on the people to make good decisions. And I feel yeah, like, yeah. at least in this country, it would seem that if you give all that power to people, they could just as easily choose, like, uh, news stations that are saying what they want to, where some clever person can get the, enough people The unfortunate together. reality is that they're already choosing that. And so the only distinction to me mm -hmm. is I think that if you force people to do it intentionally, they might be slightly more thoughtful in where they send their dollars. Um, like if you look at it, like Fox News is not like a big bastion of truth. It wins because a lot of people watch it and a lot of people love the entertainment yeah, that it yeah. provides. Um, right? Like it, it's main time anchors like Tucker Carlson and Fox and Friends. They're not out there just like, uh, here's another study published in Nature yesterday. They're out there to make you laugh along with some conservative hosts who are going to spout some BS about illegal immigrants or something. Um, it, it's infotainment. Uh, so I think that we are already, unfortunately, in this world. And we've basically been in this world since that it's been cheap enough to do more than three channels on TV. Um, um, how do, I, how do I put this? So I, I do agree that there's this risk that like people choose poorly, but we're already in this situation. The question is, how do we improve that? And my suggestion is that's why you want to slightly tighten the guardrails. Why I'm saying is like if 80% of people can agree that something is fake news. And so for reference, 10% of people think that InfoWars is, is reliable. So I think 80% would capture some stuff like InfoWars and it might capture a few more things that are slightly more reliable. Um, I don't, it sounds odd to call InfoWars reliable, but like slightly less insane than Alex Jones would also get caught in this kind of system. So that's why I'm setting a really high barrier, like 80%, but it still would catch some fake news. That's that's basically my way of thinking about these things. And I, I guess if you have a better solution, please fucking tell me because I, this is one of those things that I'm extremely worried about. Like how I mean, do you solve media fake news? I think you're trying to like democratize the carrot. And I think- The carrot? <laughs> Yeah, you're democratizing the carrot. And I think oh. it would be fun to democratize the, the stick. stick. <laughs> I think it'd be fun to get a thousand people that that are allowed to do complaints, that you're allowed to issue like a very serious complaint once a year for one like media station mm -hmm. that's like, hold up, we've got it, we've got to consider getting rid of these people. They're doing damaging shit. Mm -hmm. and you gotta make your case, and then of the people whose cases are not crazy and accepted, they go into your sortition lottery. And then we put them together and they have to decide on like which three to like cut funding from. I think that's, that would be. I mean, that's literally my proposal. It's that um, it's literally that I think that the sortition should vote. It, the, the, the first suggestion is what I left out, which is like, hey, people should submit complaints. And then the suggestion is once you get enough complaints, um, then it goes then like you've hit the 100 complaint mark. Then we pull up a little sortition thing. They rate your they rate. The, the complaints to see whether they have validity. And then if they vote to like remove your funding, they remove like, I don't know, 50% of your funding for like three months. And let's say if another one happens in another three month period, they shut you off for a hundred, maybe a third one happens, you're just off. You aren't allowed to broadcast anymore. Um, I don't know if I fully, like I don't have a perfect setup for the system, but I do actually basically think that this is democratizing both the carrot and the stick. I suppose what you could actually be doing in inverse, uh, if you want to democratize the carrot, would be let um, those citizen tribunals also, if they vote 80%, give a slight pay raise or something. Like you get a multiplier of like 1.1 times and you get slightly more money if you've had really high quality journalism or something. <laughs> but I don't know. Hmm. Or if there was, oh man, how cool would it be if there was a market for journalists the way that there's a market for like professional athletes in sport, if we had like a draft and Fox is like, no, we really want Tucker Carlson. And like, <laughs> like what if they just griff or whatever and, and we just have them on an open market and then people actually get invested in individual reporters and they can start to like actually consume news in a way that I think is more reasonable, which is like to get to know authors and like go after the ones that you like. I mean, that's, I, I agree that's like what people should be doing. Um, 
if you're talking, if you want to talk about long-term solutions, it's ultimately from the demand side of things. We know that more educated people, people who know more about news, um, people who trust science, they are enormously less likely to believe in conspiracy theories, enormously less likely to like watch Fox News, enormously less likely to vote Trump. Um, so I do agree that like changing a viewer, watcher, consumer behavior is the ultimate solution. But that's the kind of thing where like the boomers are, are going to be here for 30 years. The millennials who are going to be here for like 50 years. You can't just change the current population. You need to like deal with it as it is. Yeah. And people have been saying that with like one of the people in chat was like, oh, we just wait for the older people to die off in response to something. And I think the one thing we found throughout time is that's never a solution. Like we thought racism <laughs> would die off and stuff. Like it doesn't seem like anytime you wait for old people to die off that it solves anything. Look at Japan. They just learn how to live forever. Like I feel like waiting for old people to die is like never a very good solution for stuff. It just never really works out like that. And they get to talk and they get to be influential and spend money the whole time that they live their last few miserable lives on this earth. And they unfortunately like leave an impact that means that young people could also like adopt their ideology. I know one of the other things, and it's not like a socialist thing that I've been really red pilled on is like mandatory voting. Um, because one of the things we that we know, if we're talking about like participation in institutions, one of the things that we know is that one of the best predictors, in fact, the best predictor of whether you'll vote in the next election is whether you voted in the previous election. And so there's this enormous benefit of getting people started voting early, getting them politically involved early. And so they will be more involved in the system on and on and on. The country that's famous for this is Australia. It's, um, I don't remember when it did ranked choice voting. It has ranked choice voting, I'm pretty sure. But it's done mandatory voting since 1921 or something. It's an incredibly long time period. And so it's had like voter participation in like the 95 range for a century. Um, and so more people are just de facto involved in the political system. I, I assume that like transfers into like a slight increase of political engagement just from that very fact alone. And wait, hold on. I, I feel like you were opening up talking about how you've been like you've been turned against this idea about voting. Like no, wait, I've been are, are I'm super red pilled on this. No, I love mandatory voting. I oh, used to worry okay. that it's like government compulsion, but no, like force people to participate in democracy, and that will in turn strengthen democracy. Like it, you're. I don't know. That's the way I see it. You have so much faith in people, though. I feel like people it's, fuck shit. And it's... The, uh, the, the, uh, what's the Churchill quote? It's it's not that I love democracy. It's that I think that it's it's just statistically better than the alternative systems. And I think there's lots of tweaks you can do to democracy, in, including some really, really big ones that make it a lot more effective. Um, that's the way that I think about these things. It's not trusting the people so much as building the systems where people can be trusted. Uh, that's the way I think about these things. Yeah. So you think like re-education camps and stuff like make sure that they're everybody's on the same page kind of deal? Uh, yeah, no, right. huge re-educate. Right, the FEMA camps have been sitting empty for too long. I think that we need to we need to pink pill and re-educate our conservative brethren, right? I think so. I mean, honestly, yeah, sit them down, show them some cool shit, uh, take them to a drag show. Like, we just show them like, like could... just fucking like Sean from YouTube videos and Destiny debates for two weeks. They just come out. They're all new men. Well, asterisk <laughs> anyway on the men bit. Pink pill, after all. Pink pill. I like that, dude. I'm going to steal that. The pink pill. Is this a real thing? Uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure pink pilling is like, it originally was a 4chan meme that people were like, oh, we're, we're going to like get people to like become trans or something. We're just going to keep telling them how good to be trans is and then they'll become trans. But it is like totally a meme that like the trans community and so on has adopted. Like we're going to force feminize all the conservative men or whatever. Biden is Biden's building Biden's America where all men have to wear the skirt. First the mask, now the skirt, that kind of stuff. Are any trans people offended by that? <laughs> I mean, I'm sure. I feel like asking this question already tells you the answer. <laughs> Dang, bro. What are you saying about trans people, bro? I'm saying put in any X in there and the answer is yes. Whether it be trans people or like literally any other demographic group. But also. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to go ahead and shelve pink pill. I'll go ahead and consult the cabal of trans people and see what they think about Yeah, the hive that. mind of the trans commune, right? Like the singular right. entity that runs all trans people. I'm going to phone up the council. Okay. And like, I, I know that I know that we're meant to talk about the destiny debate, but the reason that I avoid it is because I don't think he was very fair to you. I don't think he heard you out. I don't think you had like a fair shot at changing his mind on anything. Did you think differently at the time or, or after, or what was your take on the debate as a whole? Eh, I mean, destiny brought me on from like Twitter drama. I don't think that, he was coming in with like a particularly open mind, given how he usually works on Twitter. Um, 
you know, rest in peace to gaze within. We'll see what rises from the ashes. Um, uh, I think that... I don't know. I don't know how to evaluate whether he was, like, good faith or not. That's, like... I don't actually know if I can evaluate that. I mean, we could, we could, we could not call it good faith or bad faith. But I mean, we could call it like giving you a fair shot or not. Mm -hmm. Like, I, like, ah, man, like watching it, I, I just felt like he wasn't trying to hear out the point, and that he was more so trying to get you to contend with other kinds of arguments or to get you down different lines of logic where he might have an upper hand, rather than actually like trying to hear out what you think the problem was. And I think he does that a lot with the Twitter stuff. I think that I don't know. I don't know if it's intentional. It's one of the reasons I don't want to call it bad faith. I think that um, something that is true, if we want to talk about like dirty debate tactics or whatever, I think Destiny unintentionally often takes um, people and assumes that they have more extreme or like more obtuse versions of their arguments, um, and then they like he tries to make them defend those arguments at least at first. And this is not just the Destiny thing either. Virtually every human does this in every debate. Like the reason that you're debating someone is because you sell them to say say something you thought was terrible, and you talk to them, and it's actually a little bit more reasonable. Uh, I just think Destiny is like maybe a little bit more extreme on this, particularly on the left, because he's been like really railing on people about like messaging and so on on Twitter for a long time. So I think that he is like correctly or not like pretty mad about it. <laughs> okay. And do you feel any way about how there's a difference between how those tweets are worded and how he acts when you actually get in a call with him? Or did you do you not see like a disconnect there? No, totally. On, on like totally, almost all of his conversations are like ninety percent more good faith than like most of the tweets. Okay. In my opinion. Interesting anyway. that you label them that way. I don't know if I would say that they're more good faith, but I would say he has a stronger, more like reasonable view, like uh, argument when on uh, in the conversations than he does on the tweet and i think he tries to pretend that the tweets are like oh it's the same thing i'll defend anything on twitter like yeah well when you write it like that though people want to argue with the dude that wrote that not the dude who's now making like a 10 point powerpoint slide on why they're right mm -hmm. like i and, and, and like i don't know if that's disingenuous or not i have a hard time with that i don't i don't get tricked into arguing with them about that dumb shit so as somebody who got tricked like what's your opinion on that like do you have a i mean i don't know that, that i got tricked cool i think that probably like to me it's a nice thing probably to like debate with the larger creator i suppose um but like also i just felt like um i don't know he seems to for some reason think that i'm like the good socialist so i'll lean into that role um uh, if for no other reason than I think that probably like I can I would like to try and make Destiny less mad at the left um, given that like we're still in a scenario where for like 32 days running the president has refused to concede an election right we're, we're, we're living in a world where conservatives are increasingly becoming national conservatives I would so much rather he focus on that than focus on lefties saying really dumb things on Twitter which has been a constant for all of history um, you know Marx was fucking tweeting it out just dumb ass shit incredible that's a brilliant idea you know how I'm gonna get them to focus on him a little bit more Mm -hmm. I think I think I'm gonna keep I'm I think I'm gonna jump in the chat of some conservative people and tell them that he's talking shit. I think that's how I'll do it, dude. If he's it not gonna work. do it on Twitter, I'll do it for him. I'll make shit up, bro. I'll well, he can't do it now, out. so you better do it. <laughs> I mean, technically, he can't do it now. What account are we on now? He'll figure it out. He'll come Probably up with five it or six. I, I bet you he has a new one already. We just don't know what it is. <laughs> Damn. Okay. Well, yeah. I, I guess I guess it is helpful because it it gives you an in. And if uh, if he put on the more agreeable version in the tweet, maybe it wouldn't give you as big of an opportunity to uh, try and have a heated conversation about it. Who on the platform have you seen that you think actually changes their mind on shit? Who gives you that impression? Oh God. Um. I guess hard. so one of the problems that I have is I very rarely actually watch like Twitch and this, this isn't just meant to be like a um I, I know it sounds odd as a streamer but like I really <laughs> and it's for a dumb reason too um I basically can't watch things unless I'm watching on like two to four times speed because it's just too slow okay I need there's two I have too little time in my life I need to get more shit done I need to watch it faster and guess what I can't watch on two times speed real life content okay um so I really hate watching Twitch, so I actually can't engage with that one too much, and I haven't done too many panels. Maybe come back to me in a month or something. <laughs> um, 
Well, what's your thought on panels, bro? You're brand new to panels. How's that feeling? What do you think about panels? Do you like panel? Any panel more than four people is cancer, and even over two people is often cancer because there just isn't enough time for people to fully strengthen their ideas. What you get are these very surface-level debates that kind of skim over the surface of a topic like a fucking like a stone bouncing over water, and they never actually sink in and like settle on one topic. Um, this is like a super niche, niche question. Are you familiar with Robert's Rules of Order? <laughs> I am not. Um, they're like these archaic rules that were created in the 1920s by some guy named Robert about how to run a meeting. Um, and um, basically, one of the big takeaways from them to me is that highly productive conversations are linear, which sounds like an odd thing. But basically, what you want to do is you want to come to a topic. It's like, should we increase funding for the marketing campaign committee by 5%? And you need to come to a conclusion on that one and close it so you don't come back to it and then move on to the next topic. Um, this is actually something that Destiny did, I thought, very well. He tried to do in his debate with me and, De- and Bastia. He tried to linearize the conversation. He was like, I want to finish the first premise, complete that, and then get on to the second premise, and complete that, and get on to the third premise, and complete that. Twitch panels never, ever fucking do this, because they say one premise, and then someone gets really mad, and then they're off to, like, the fifth premise. They want to debate about the fifth premise, and then they're back to the third, they're back to the fourth, and so on. And people are just mad all the time, instead of actually trying to come to a conclusion on one premise so they can form the whole argument and linearize the conversation. Uh, yeah, that's my take. I fucking hate it. <laughs> but they're very fun. So on the other hand, if you were to treat panels as a kind of beauty contest where you get like a few hours, uh, according to whatever the, the rules are, of the panel to just make your idea look good and to flaunt it at, like, if you approach it that way, what would you say are like the best like approaches that you would take for your own positions? Like, how would you trounce them about if that was the purpose rather than like actually coming to consensus on anything with the members of the panel? Well, there's this quote from fucking Reagan, which is that um, um, if you're explaining you're losing, generally what you want to try and do is be quote unquote on the attack. You want to like have a point, which is very hard for other people to attack. And you just want to put it out there and force them to defend and explain their ideas. Um, and while you're just like demolishing them or whatever, that's the, the the best route. And so generally what that means is you don't want to be defending the, the niche parts of your ideology. This is one of the reasons that I, so regardless of like the niche position on the, on the holodomor or whatever, one of the reasons I hate tankies um, is because most of their work is spent trying to justify these old, highly flawed socialist systems instead of advancing new and strong points. They, they spend 99% of their time trying to defend that Stalin never did nothing wrong and, um, and, and it just doesn't, it's not useful because you get spend all this time explaining and you don't spend any time like arguing for like what's actually good about socialism um, and to me, and to my mind anyway. And so you want to start with like the really strong stuff like, hey, why do you guys think that hierarchical, undemocratic worker, um, like non-worker co-ops, right? The conventional enterprise is totally hierarchical. Why do you guys think that, that is a good system for structuring firms and force them to defend it, I guess is the way that I think about it. Uh, instead of being like, well, actually, the Soviet Union grew very quickly, and you can see it in this graph from this one <laughs> academic that nobody trusts sort of thing. Okay, and how do you balance? But be, because there, it seems like you are aware that, like, at a rhetorical level, people are not cool with, like, any kind of defense of those old systems, and they have their preconceived notions. So even if you had statistics or whatever, even if you had the God argument, you're not mm-hmm. winning that. Like, yeah, that's the point, right? How do you... Even if you're yeah. right, you don't win. <laughs> But how do you balance that? Like in conversation, how are you like navigating these rhetorical pitfalls, especially as somebody who, whose ideology and whose like side of the aisle has so many of them, I feel like. Sure. I don't know that I'm a great example of this. Um, so I can't say that I like am the, the perfect guy on this one. I really do like getting into weird anecdotes and like trying to prove something with data. Um, I, one of the things I suppose I'm like quote unquote famous for or whatever is I've got this really long fact sheet called the Stinky Right Winger Fact Sheet. It's got like, I want to say like 5,000 studies or something. And they're all like on these tiny little niche things so that I can win all of the arguments instead of just winning the big ones. Um, so again, I'm probably not the best one to look to for this. But okay. um, where I'm effective, what I, what I try and do is... I, I think about, I, basically, I want to think about these conversations the way I was thinking about it before. Think about it as a linear conversation. You want the viewer to start with the premise, which is like, hey, I think equality is pretty good, and end with the conclusion, which is like, hey, I think that highly concentrated capital is probably bad, and maybe distributing it is good, something along those lines. You want to like focus on the big things instead of the really minor things. Uh, think about it as like that line, that goal. But again, I, <laughs> I can't really recommend myself as an example. I love you. Okay. All right. Well, that's all I have for you, unless you had anything else you wanted to talk about. Um, 
I mean, so what would you describe your political position at the moment as, right? Before you read all of my books and totally change your politics, right? Because I'm just right about everything. What would, what would like the current Booksmart's position be? Um, like I like to tell people on stream, if I had Thanos's glove and I could snap into reality, whatever I wanted, it would be very yikers. And I don't think anybody would really like me. Oh my um, God. My man <laughs> hiding his power level. <laughs> yeah. But like, realistically, I, I mostly lean towards Democrat stuff, but that's because it seems like common sense. It seems like if you were to like, to, you know, create a consciousness in like a fake person that knew English and like had all the basics down and you explain to them like the positions of the of the Democrats versus the Republicans. I feel like as long as that robot has empathy in it, it'll figure out that like, oh, shit, wait, no, that's fucked up. Why would we do it that way? That doesn't make any sense. Like, of course, we want to like like trend towards policies that are bringing everybody up at the same time and making sure like if I get born in a body that's poor or disabled or this or that I don't get fucked over for no apparent reason just because other people were like too greedy or whatever to fucking make sure that mm -hmm. I would be able to live a decent life and so like that's the only reason but I mean like if I Thanos snap stuff that turns very different very quickly and I feel like that's still difficult for me to resolve in my mind so I try not to talk about politics very much Fair enough. Um, I guess the reason I was just asking is I was wondering, like, one of the things that's interesting to me is, like, what anchors people? I generally think of beliefs as these amalgamations of a whole bunch of smaller sub-beliefs. And so the way people change their beliefs over time is one or two of them gets deleted. They shift a little bit in one direction. They, like, lose anchors on one side, so they shift to the other side. Um, and so slowly over time, people, like, get anchors that move, something along those lines. And... What's interesting to me is like why people, to me, I'm anchored further on the left. So I'm asking people like, why are people to the right of me? What anchors them over to the right? So basically, like if you had to recommend books or articles or whatever that would like keep you towards the right and not towards the left, what would be like those ideas, books or articles? Wake up, little boy. Oh. I love you. Ugh. And if you don't want to say, it's fine. <laughs> like, um... I'm bad because I can't name authors. Like I can name authors if I just wrote a paper about them, but mm -hmm. otherwise I forget names. Um, there's a lot, like every time, because what I do professionally is I take college classes and write like graduate papers for people. Mm -hmm. And anytime I get to do like political philosophy, I love learning about who like the socialist thinkers are. I love learning about like more fair forms of government. I like reading about like different ideas or takes on justice. I like reading about like how we could change the incentive structures of government such that they are working for the people and not necessarily this other nonsense. And I think if that calculus is made clear enough, you could show that to people and sell them on politicians that follow or adhere to that system. And I, I like, that's why I focus so much on the branding of socialism, because I feel like if a bunch of people got together and they made rules for how politicians are meant to like decide on different laws and stuff, and all of them got together in a union and said, hey, every politician that joins us is held to this. You'll be kicked out if you don't. Like like their own party that actually follows shit that's okay. I feel like people would pick that. And I feel like if it was made simple enough, people would go for it. But I've changed on that over time. So I, I would say there's a lot of like socialist thinkers that make me think that's probably the way we want to go. But... Uh, I don't think they've convinced me enough to like have faith that that's ever going to happen. It's more like at an idea level, well, mm -hmm. duh, of course we want to do this. Like, unless you're a sociopath and you don't care about other people, like, it seems like you would want to pick this. Like, I, I honestly don't get how like at an empathic level, anybody chooses conservative ideals. Like, I, I really don't. <laughs> Fair enough. I totally get that. Um, so I don't want to like force you to name a book. I was going to focus on one thing you said that mm. you have trouble remembering names one of the things that has been incredibly helpful to me is like a, a thinker um and a lot of people mention that like like very successful like academics mention this a lot as they're part of their thinking process is this creation of like a fact sheet there's this really famous psychologist whose name i'm forgetting and he was renowned because he would write down every study that he would cite on like a little note card and he would like write the author write like the title and then on the reverse he would like write the implications of the study and so to me one of the most important things that i've done is just create this big long fact sheet where i have like a link to the study a brief summary of it before the link and then some quote or some image from the study afterwards so immediately i know what the study says and i can just recall it so much quicker um do the same have thing for books to, just super helpful have you talked to derry cohey nope well you would really like derry cohey you and him both on that fact sheet thing 
He's got a really long one. He's like a historian, bro. He's got like every destiny argument or some bullshit in there. He's got like oh a, a bunch of stuff in his. Um, Yo, you might like that. Hello? I personally hate that. I go crazy. I, there's some some bit of my brain when I start like organizing all the knowledge and stuff. It, it really trips me out to have it on paper. So sometimes if that hits a certain point, I just delete stuff and I don't know why. <laughs> like Minecraft worlds, if they start getting too complicated, I like lose interest and I'll delete them. Or like a drawing, I'll just like start losing interest as it grows in complexity and like delete it. Damn. Work systems, like if they hit a certain point of complexity, I have to simplify them or I'll delete them. I feel like note systems are like that too. Like I love deleting a notes file after I finish an essay. There's some kind of like Zen quality to that that I love. Just like, you know, it, making something out of sand and then breaking it down and like watching it all go away. But I should consider the fact sheet thing if I'm going to do this. That'll probably be good. Have you heard of Zettelkasten? Nope. It's like that, a, wait, that's uh, literally what we're talking about. <laughs> wait, I was just pulling yeah. it up. No, the 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 guy I was mentioning is called Nicholas Luhmann, and he made Zettelkasten. That's the okay that's the point. Because I was gonna say, if you like this way of thinking about things, you would really love this system. When you told me you didn't hear about it, I'm like, oh, he's gonna love this. Yeah, I, I've thought about using this for um for book projects like when people commission books just because there's too much fucking info and like a normal note taking system doesn't organize it like visually in a way that's accessible mm -hmm. um there's some programs out now that i've gotten recommended from a podcast called uh, uh cortex which is basically like a, a a podcast about working and productivity and it's uh the cgp gray youtuber guy from uh youtube whatever mm -hmm. he talks about how the way that he does note taking is like the index card thing that you have in zettelcast in. Mm -hmm. and so he found like electronic systems that could do that and that might be worth looking into if you really like organizing stuff that way personally i don't like the memory in my head sort of works like that but when i draw it out i i can't navigate the the this like index up, card thing bro? how do you lay Hello, this bro? out if you're not using zettelcast <laughs> I have, I have a 7,400 line notepad um, plus plus document. That's how okay, I can organize see, it. That's what I can't handle. That shit gives me anxiety, dude. That That's the kind of shit I do be deleting. I can't, I can't hold on to it. It's just, <laughs> in my mind, it's a big long list, okay? And I know where in the list it is and I go and grab it. Oh, how I hate big long lists. But hey, of course, the socialist perhaps communist i don't know i don't want to presume dude loves his lists and his systems and his bureaucracy i mean if there's one thing socialists are uh, famous for it's drawing up lists right <laughs> <laughs> among other things yeah <laughs> well um if that's all i guess this is where we part ways I got to sure. write a stupid fucking paper that's the only reason i'm ending it right now sure uh <laughs> No, this has been wonderful. Do you want to like plug yourself and I can plug myself or something along those lines? Hell yeah. Do you want to go first? Uh, sure. Why not? I'm Aiden. I run the channel Socialism Done Left. Uh, I do debates. I do streams. I do interviews. And you can find me on YouTube, Twitch, or Twitter. Uh, that's Sock Done Left. S O C D O N E L E F T. There you go. Cool dude. Cool dude. I'm Book Smarts. I review debates and conversations people have, and I give them tips on how they might improve or direct them towards what is not working in their favor. Um, I'm trying to do more conversations like this, but I'm not too great at the interview stuff, to be honest. It's, I have to get better at it. Um, perhaps looking up more about your content and stuff would have helped that, but hey. I mean, I guess it depends on what you're trying to get out of it. I felt this was actually reasonably productive for like picking my brain. I, if you were trying to do like a get me on something sort of thing or like for hold me to something like a, uh i don't know no. quite what you call it I, I mean i know that wasn't the goal for this one but i'm saying like for future ones if there's someone that you want to like try and get like to hold to a position you might need to do more confrontational sort of thing that's all yeah true yeah no i, I mean like i'm just memeing on you about all the socialist stuff i'm just looking for jokes if i'm being quite honest i wish <laughs> that like i wasn't born in a world where that shit was stigmatized and that's why i kept asking about the brand stuff and tried to like get answers from you on that because like i do think it's unfortunate that the branding is this bad and yeah. i think it's duly unfortunate that the people who are like proponents of this of these ideas kind of hurt 
they they make that even worse with the way they choose to tackle it, with the way they choose to like make it palatable to, uh, palatable to people. I feel like I mean that's one of the reasons. On... Sorry. Oh, go ahead. I was just, that's the reason that I hate on like tankies. It's the the reason the brand is so stigmatized is in part because of these like enormous historical anti democratic failures. Just making people think more about it ain't gonna like destigmatize the brand. You gotta focus on something positive. It's not just like whitewash the negative which also is like historically horrible and ignores people's suffering and so on. But like leaving all that aside is also just bad branding. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's, it's like, it's not helping. And if the problem is branding itself, you probably don't want to take the, uh, the path forward that risks more damage to the brand. Um, but yeah, maybe rhetoric will help, but I doubt it. I started out thinking you could tell everybody to work on their rhetoric and like, Oh, it's not your <laughs> logic. I promise here. Like maybe you're a genius. You just have to explain it better. Like, no, I, I'm going to have to start <laughs> criticizing that. A little bit optimistic, but I get it. Yeah, at first. Um, Anywho. Well, thanks again for the conversation. I don't want to keep you from your paper. And I really appreciate, uh, I, I guess I already appreciate the conversation. Thank you. Have a nice day. <laughs> have a good one, guys. Bye. <sighs> Folks, uh, one, thanks to everyone who followed. Uh, two,